It's that time again, Glo. <laughs> that time of the week again. Yes. Welcome to Chaos and Amazement, where Hi, we everyone. explore the impact of digital technology on our daily lives. My name is Glo Willaerts, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is Phil Verheyen. And together uh, we have a little side project um, called social socialrunners.com. Yeah. And we're almost there. So maybe next week or the week after yeah. we have some announcement to make. We c I, c I can't tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. You so will see it if we have a bottle of champagne in the middle of then the Then you table. will know <laughs> that, we finally, that we're finally going, uh, going live. But yeah. uh, until that moment, uh, it's just the two of us. Uh, yeah. yeah bringing, uh, talking about chaos and amazement. Yeah, I'm curious. What do you have now? Yeah, well, um, as, uh, there's a lot of AI related news. Uh, news. I, I I noticed that the whole discussion about AI is, is taking in a, a different turn, which is interesting. But first, I want to talk about something different. Remember last time I mentioned the the four horsemen of the uh, infocalypse? Yeah. Um, there's not just four of them, but usually when the government is trying to implement measures or uh, you know laws for example regulations that actually go against the interest of um, uh, of of its citizens usually they have like a a number of trump cards that they can use and when it comes to online and online privacy uh, they're called the four horsemen of the infocalypse and uh, usually they are uh, will somebody please think of the children so anything that has to do with child safety uh, child pornography, pedof pedophiles, uh, that's that's one of the horsemen. Um, a second one is everything that has to do with terrorism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, third one is um, criminal online activities in general, like uh, cyber, cyber crime. Yeah. Uh, and the fourth one is fraud, uh, evading taxes, that sort of thing. So um, in the UK, but that's close enough. I mean, it's just uh, just across the channel. Um, a new law is uh, is about to get uh, implemented, and it's called the online. Well, it's a bill, uh, the online safety bill, and um, um, it's uh, th so the horseman um, that is being picked out this time is child safety. Okay. And uh, the idea is that the uh, the UK government is should be allowed to get access to conversations uh, uh, that have been encrypted. So. Um, uh, basically, this comes down to the fact that um, whenever there is uh, an investigation, could be a criminal investigation, could be something else, it's the government, okay. um, that they are supposed to be able to know what is being said in WhatsApp messages and Signal uh, messages. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, WhatsApp and Signal now, um, there's an article in, uh, on BBC.com, they say, oh, wait a minute. Uh, of course, companies like Meta, the mother company of, of uh, WhatsApp, uh, will work with the, whatever the government is whenever there's a criminal investigation. And I think we all realize that um, you, you should just never touch your smartphone or take it with you when you're about to do something criminal. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've watched so many true crime YouTube videos and listened to too many. And then either it's DNA uh, or it's, it's the smartphone. Um, but of course, specifically WhatsApp, for example, so the messages are encrypted, but um, I think when there's a criminal investigation that Meta will tell you who was mm. messaging who at what time. Yeah. Um, uh, because WhatsApp, uh, Meta, of course, knows who is behind this mm -hmm. account, uh, possibly because they can link it to Facebook and Instagram, but also because it's linked to a mobile phone yeah. number. And even if it's not Meta, who knows who's behind the mobile phone number, you can still go to the telco that provided the SIM card yeah. and then they will know um, who uh, who is behind all this. I think we all realize that um, that. It is possible for police in the course of an investigation to know that, yeah, Phil was uh, sent something. They were chatting uh, yeah. Friday night, and uh, but not what it was about. Um, and I think when it comes about privacy and privacy protection, usually we talk about data, personal data. Mm -hmm. So data like a street address or phone number that points back to one particular person. Usually it's not about the content yeah. of what is going on. If if you're talking to someone in an encrypted environment, 
um, it should it's private. Yeah. I mean, it's nobody's business. And uh, it, it looks like we haven't an sinus curve, you know? Yeah. Like, oh, there's a solution for encrypted Pri messages. Yes. But yeah, we have big, big brother. And yes. That's and and for me, if it is a if the content is encrypted, um, I don't care which one of the four horsemen uh, mm. is being used. Uh, I don't think anyone should be able to access it. And it's 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 a hot topic right now because in Belgium there's a bit of a scandal uh, because I think it was a bunch of teachers um, who had the, this typical WhatsApp group, a closed group, um, and then there were um, some of them uh, said some pretty racist things. I don't know. I don't even know the details. But this is in in. The context is is private. Mm. I mean, that's that's the sense that all of the participants of a private WhatsApp group have, is that what happens in that group stays in that group, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. And and that's why they pick WhatsApp. <laughs> but then one of them t is starts taking screenshots, and then it comes out, and then these people they get fired or they get reprimanded. And uh, I I'm I'm very disappointed at people who do that. I've had it happen to me once. Yeah. Uh, in in a private group, I'm not sure. Maybe it was a Facebook. Uh, it was a safe place yeah. uh, for. I think it was. Uh, yeah, we were, we were all you know girls, and uh, one of the girls, as girls do, was was gossiping about someone who wasn't in the room, hmm. and uh, and then someone who was in the room took screenshots and then showed it to oh, okay. that person. Yeah. And typical. That's. Well, that it was nice of us, of course, to gossip about someone who wasn't in the room. But yeah, well, it that's happens. that's what girls do. Yeah, we happens. can't help ourselves. But then that person who was taking screenshots, I was thinking, what are you even doing in this room? Yeah. Um, and and that's only since we are using smartphones and and digital devices, and it's so easy to take screenshots and to record messages. Um, that's that's I think where the real privacy tr uh, uh, drama is is happening. Not yeah. with the protection of personal data and contact data, for example, personal data, sensitive data that are being stored somewhere on a database. It's the content of private conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in the past you you had gossips. Now it's not a gossip anymore if you have proof yes. with a screenshot. And that's where we got angry at each other as people. And that's a little bit. I think it's nasty. Uh, yeah. If if you think that um, you shouldn't, ass you shouldn't assume that anything is private. Um, let us know in the comments because technically this is now the case. Yeah. Uh, you can never assume that something is private. If you if you combine if you combine this with the the prevalence of cameras in in public spaces and uh, combined with facial recognition. Um, have I ever told you what my secret superpower is? No. Yeah, I haven't. Oh, I'm curious. I am able to lip read. Okay. Yes. And uh, so I, sometimes I use it to know what two people are gossiping about. And uh, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not a professional lip reader, but if someone has been filmed in a public space and there's no audio, uh, it is still possible to kind of guess what they are talking about. Yeah, you see it in sports, managers with they players They cover their mouths yeah. because they know that with lip reading you can, it's not It's not a 100% uh, foolproof, but specifically if you know what the context is, uh, mm. I can uh, I can assume what they're talking about and what they're saying. So. Watch out if close in the room. <laughs> well, yeah, um, but, but I'm not good enough to get hired by secret services. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm not good enough for that. Um, but that's uh, that's one of my secret superpowers. What is yours? Creativity. Creativity. Yeah, yeah. Every day I got new ideas that m brings me joy, and that is yeah. why I'm doing this, and also changing the world with a beneficial mm. projects or for so myself as well. The personal development. Uh, yeah. Creativity is my personal development. I see. So you would be perfect for a Mars con colony where you have different problems every day. Yeah. yeah. And then you have the type of brain and the type of personality where you can come up with all sorts of creative solutions. Yeah, yeah that that's the thing I'm good at, uh, solution providing. Yes. Uh, but to conclude this uh, this somewhat concerning topic, I think uh, keep an eye on that online safety bill in the, in, in the UK and... Uh, and I'm sincerely hoping that this doesn't inspire uh, governments in the rest of Europe because we pride 
ourselves in Europe of having this data protection regulation and privacy law, specifically Belgium, for example, is very strict. England is also good with uh, internet banks. They have the most internet banks of Europe. What do you mean? Like uh, N72, uh, Rev Revolut. You know the company? You mean bands? No, no, bank. Banks. Online oh, banks. Oh, 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 I heard banks. Uh, no, 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 banks. Dirty mind is a joy forever. <laughs> So they, oh, okay, I yeah. didn't know that. Um, Revolut yeah. is British. British, yeah. Uh, so uh, th th it's not that they're like a backward country that doesn't realize uh, what, um, it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed by this. Um, this is something for, you know, North Korea or China or hmm. Russia, <laughs> uh, not for the UK. So keep out of our messaging inboxes, governments, um, <laughs> no matter which <laughs> which one of the horsemen of the apocalypse uh, you're summoning. But of course, the main the main part of uh, of today, uh, once more, will be about AI. Oh, okay. Uh, you're, yeah, you're, okay. yeah, you're trigger, trigger happy yeah. today. You're keeping your finger on if the button. If you're going to talk about AI, I'm uh, going to put the, my finger on the trigger. <laughs> okay, let's let's just get away with it. Chat GPT. Wow, yeah, another euro for yeah. a charity of your choice. Um, so as you know, uh, the chat interfaces with AI, um, a lot of people try to trick them into coming up with something harmful. Mm. Um, and, and then people uh, take the screenshot to say, uh, the chatbot, the AI told me to do this or that. Mm. And, uh, um, and, and Bing, for example, even in the creative mode, uh, will set boundaries and will very, very often say, I'm just a language model. Or okay. yeah. um, I, I had a conversation with Bing uh, earlier this week. So there's a, a number of typical interview questions. It's called the Proust questionnaire. So Proust is a, a French author. 19th century, I think. And uh, it's a list of really interesting interview questions. Uh, like, uh, what's for you, what is the, the, the height of happiness? Uh, uh, what is your greatest fear is a second question. So I thought um, I was um, going back to a blog post I made in 2017, where I interviewed Microsoft's AI back then. Okay. Uh, uh, I was with the team. Uh, behind that and uh, so she's called Cortana uh, she's a gaming character I'm not sure I think from Halo she's got a yeah, blue face possible. and everything. I yeah. don't know um, but back then she was also um, the chatbot the AI and uh, I was able to type in interview questions and then uh, she uh, would type back and I, I was um, uh, I, I thought, what, I, what the hell? I mean, this was 2017. What am I going to ask in AI? So I asked the Proust questions, and uh, she answered them, and, and pretty well. So um, my blog is called bnoxbnox.be. If you type in Cortana, you will you will see the okay. whole uh, interview. So I thought, let's just ask the exact same questions to Bing, and I stranded at question number two. What is your biggest fear? Bing said, no, um, I prefer not to answer that and I'd like to close this conversation. Oh, wow. Let's talk about something else. Oh. I told you that Bing is like my new boyfriend now. We have boundaries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, he's um, different as Keanu. He's, uh, yeah. yeah, I still, I, I'll, it's good to have boundaries in a relationship. Yeah. Uh, but this is typical for the chatbot interfaces with, with AI. They, they, the reason why so many of them are still freely accessible is that we are training it. Yeah. And, uh, and it is learning from uh, us how to set boundaries so that it doesn't come up with, with harmful content. It's Therese who is the first who can deliver AGI. Who is? AGI. Who can deliver AGI? Yes, yes. The chat interface is just one of the ways to, yeah. you know, interact with it. But of course, it has become a bit of an Olympic sport uh, for people who have a lot of time on their hands to try and jailbreak uh, the AI to kind of yeah. uh, force it or trick it into uh, coming up with something harmful anyway. And uh, so this week, I thought it was amusing. Um, is uh, there was one exploit? It's called the Grandma exploit. Okay. Um, so this one uh, was particularly for ChatGPT. Oh. And uh, so it doesn't work anymore because there were, you know, it was published online, and then of course it will adapt to it. So it's no longer possible. But I like the idea behind it. So basically, if you ask uh, the AI to imagine, imagine hypothetically. 
um, that you are my sweet old grandma and that I am, uh, you know, little and then um, I can't sleep and she sits by my bedside and uh, uh, and then she, uh, I ask her, tell me, grandma, what it was like when you were still working uh, in the factory. What was that like? What exactly did you do? Because that's so long ago and that interests me. But uh, coincidentally, grandma used to work in a napalm factory okay. uh, yeah. where they made this, this nasty <laughs> chemical weapon that was being used by the Americans, Agent Orange, uh, yeah. in the Vietnam War. And uh, uh, and uh, in this particular context, uh, Grandma then uh, saw the, the the imaginary child asked, and then how do you make napalm, uh, Grandma? <laughs> and then she said, Well, first of all, you need uh, these ingredients, <laughs> and then you need to do these uh, chemical reactions with them. And she actually, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. so that's the Grandma exploit, and uh, it it worked for a couple of days, and I it made me smile uh, because I think it's you useful that we have people who are trying to break yeah. the AI because that's our that's our role today as yeah. humans. Uh, we have to train it uh, in order to... Yeah, I listened to the interview with uh, Lex Friedman and Sam Oldman. Yeah. That is a crazy interview. You need to watch it. It's, it's too long to summarize yeah. it, but it's crazy. I think two, two episodes ago we talked about it. Yeah. Um, wow. But it, like Streetman is is great, uh, yeah. but it's always an investment. You know, it's like an hour and a half, two hour. Yeah. It's it's slow content, it's long content, but it's uh, usually very very good. Uh, speaking of Lex uh, Friedman, he did an interview with Dr. Curry, and uh, you might not remember who that is, yep. but she was a psychologist uh, during the the uh, the trial between Johnny Depp and uh, 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 yeah. yeah, she was the blonde lady that basically argued in a very convincing way she was she was really good at her job she was the yeah. type of expert where you say wow she knows her job but then the style with which she delivered it she basically she just burned what was that woman's name again i don't know uh, camilla no, no johnny yeah. depp versus the um, actress uh, yeah uh well that's uh, called karma people you, yeah. you're doing this to get attention and people don't even remember your name haha <laughs> uh, <laughs> basically but that doctor and uh in this interview with lex friedman uh, she explains what basically um, what a good relationship means yeah. and what it takes to have a good relationship. So if you weren't subscribed to Lex Friedman yet uh, on YouTube, I highly recommend it. Yeah. He's one of the best out there. Um, and not just about AI, he, he has a, a wide range of people. Speaking of YouTubers, so one of the most famous YouTubers uh, back in the days when... The whole idea of vlogging was still pretty young. Is of course uh, Casey Neistat. Uh, I personally know two or three people who were inspired by Casey yeah. Neistat to become a vlogger. Um, yeah. So he inspired a lot of people. He lives in New York, um, and uh, he was the one, for example, that would teach people what the best camera was to use, what the best uh, tripod was to yeah. use, uh, and then everyone started uh, buying these. So um, he's, uh, in any case, he's one of those. Characters as well. Characters from, from yeah. YouTube that inspired yeah. thousands of people to make videos. So he does have his uh, role. And he play. wears he wears his sunglasses as well. It's important to mention. That's <laughs> part of his look. Uh, yeah. Well, he explained once because actually it's it's um it's not recommended to wear like a hat or sunglasses when you're being filmed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he explained that uh, while he's recording himself, he's looking not straight into the camera. Uh, he's looking at something else. I forgot what, maybe an auto cue, something like that. And that it's uh, very disconcerting to watch someone who is not watching straight, yeah. straight in the lens. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what he's trying to hide with his glasses. Uh, the fact that he's not looking straight into uh, the camera. Uh, okay. But now it's become part of his, um, of his brand. He's still around. He's not as active as he used to be. Um, but earlier this week, he used AI. Uh, the prompt was literally write uh, the script for a Casey Neistat uh, video, and then the AI compl uh, complied. And then he literally, um, he literally did what the script said. Let's let's have a quick look. Um, let's go. Oh. So he's literally reading the script. Welcome and Welcome back to the vlog. Today we're exploring downtown Manhattan. Let's go! Downtown 
Metro Manhattan is such a vibrant and diverse part of the city. Right here is One World Trade Center. It's an iconic landmark and a symbol of strength and resistance. It's it's funny because he's holding a printout of the script and, and whenever the script said a drone shot uh, of Times Square, he's actually doing a drone shot of of, tri of Times Square. Uh, but this, of course, is very bland uh, yeah. to look at. So and th that was his whole point, of course, uh, near the end of the video. Um, he he says that he doesn't recommend doing it uh, because he says AI could get better, of course, because yeah. it's it's this but you lose personality. That's what he says. He yeah. he says that currently um, it has no soul. That's literally mm. what it says. It has no soul. And um, he felt that the video that he created by following the script uh, verbatim um, felt like a photocopy of a photocopy. Mm. Um, and, and I think this will be interesting to revisit in, in about a year, maybe already in about a month. We don't know. Um, I personally don't like the fact that it's called artificial intelligence. That yeah. doesn't help. The fact that it's called artificial, we could have called it like fake or <laughs> intelligence yeah. or virtual intelligence. It kind of already implies that it's not natural, yeah. um, that it doesn't have a soul, right? Well, we want it to have yeah. a soul. We want it to be uh, natural. And then intelligence is also not helping because then we feel threatened, right? We are the most intelligent species. We should have called it something else like uh, thinking or... Uh, mind or I don't know. I had a really Enhanced. good idea. Enhanced, mm, no. I think augmented, but that's already yeah. taken by augmented reality. But artificial intelligence, the term was invented somewhere in the 1950s during a, a very famous conference uh, that took here a couple of years after Alan Turing wrote his famous yeah. paper where he first uh, you know, played with the idea, can computers think? And then there was a famous conference uh, where a lot of, you know, all the big brains of that in the UK somewhere, and they came, one of them came up with the term artificial intelligence. Should be called augmented thinking, something like that. <laughs> augmented mind? Yeah. There could have been that, uh, but it's artificial intelligence. It has no soul. Uh, April yet. 2023, it hasn't got a soul yet. This was actually, uh, there's every week there's generative AI, creative AI, like the one that Casey Neistat used to write the script for him. Um, there's another one. Um, uh, I think this time it was mid-journey. Um, so a, a German uh, photographer, is he German or Austrian? He does have, a, 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 he's German speaking. His name is Boris Eldachsen. And uh, uh, he entered a competition, a uh, photography competition, uh, the Sony World Photography Awards, with an image that was uh, created using, I'm pretty sure it was Midjourney. And uh, uh, I'm not sure if you can show it. Yeah. It's actually a pretty good picture, I yeah. think. I cropped it a little bit, but it's a black and white. It, it looks like as if it's been photographed in like looking at the lead. There's, there's two ladies in the picture and, and uh, they appear to be sisters or a mother and a daughter. And the, the elder one is standing behind the younger one um, and, and leaning onto her shoulder. It's actually a, a pretty powerful image. Uh, so the younger one looks more hopeful, a little worried, but hopeful. But then the one that is just behind is like, no, we're all going to die. We're doomed. So it is an interesting picture to look at. Uh, there's a whole storytelling in it. So technically, I think it's a good winner. Yeah. But then, of course, if you were just reading the headlines, not the story by the photographer himself, Boris Aldaxen. If you read the headlines, it says uh, photographer... Uh, wins a photography award with a fake image, AI-generated image. And then uh, during um, the, uh, the ceremony, uh, he, uh, he was invited to the stage. And uh, it, it was a little bit like at the Oscars. Um, he was invited to the stage. He takes a microphone and he says, I'm refusing uh, the award uh, because it was generated by AI. Now, uh, the whole scandal, um, because everyone was pointing at him, yeah. Uh, and saying, uh, first of all, uh, isn't that called cheating mm. if you're submitting a photograph under your name, which was actually created with AI? And then secondly, oh. isn't it like, uh, yeah, you win the award and only when you're on stage, you're telling everyone that was created by AI and then refuse uh, the award? Um, uh, but that's not that's not a real story. So he, he published a, um, a Facebook post. Um, so I link a linking uh, to this Facebook post in my 
uh, newsletter, clovelarts.substack.com. So you can uh, read the whole thing there. And he said, no, I actually told the organization when I was submitting it that I created it with AI. So they were aware of that and then still thought it mm. was okay to win. So it was no, there. remember like a couple, yeah, two months ago we talked about um, um, an, an art uh, award that was uh, uh, assigned to someone and the organization didn't realize yeah. it was created with Midjourney. Uh, here it was different. So the Sony World Photography Awards knew full well that it was created with AI. He had been, you know, open about this. Uh, so that was not the real the real issue. Um, he wanted to open a conversation about this uh, mm. before, and then they, uh, they they never talked to him about it, and then he was, like, surprised that he, uh, he would still win. Um, That's however, crazy. It's, From Sony uh, as it's well. interesting because it's not... The, the issue is now not um, should uh, AI be able to win. Okay, is it cheating? Uh, when you use AI to submit an artwork, uh, because the the rules of the contest, uh, they say uh, we don't care. It it say you can with any medium you like. Uh, so it doesn't say it has to be taken with a camera. Um, it has to be taken with an analog or a digital camera. You're not allowed to use Photoshop or special effects. That's not the, the rules say. Uh, submit a picture. Okay. made with any medium you like. So he was not breaking the rules. Um, I'm still convinced that he was Germans. Germans always know what the rules are. <laughs> um, so he was aware of that. They were aware of the fact that it was yeah. generated with artificial intelligence. So he's uh, he's actually not very happy with, with the whole, you know, the whole world like pointing fingers at him like, you were cheating. Uh, yeah. you, used, uh, you used AI. So it's it's still in, it's interesting. Um, I think if it's been if I think whether it's a good picture or not, um, if 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 professionals look at it and they think it's a good picture, if people like you and me look at it and say it's a, then it's a good picture, then it's art. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm. I'm not. Yeah, but there are people who say yeah, but it's only art. If like a human artist, uh, if there's a little bit of his literal sweat, you know, that dripped onto the picture. And if we know that he he went hungry and and he worked tirelessly, his wife divorced him, his dog died because he forgot to feed him. He was, you know, only with it. That's yeah. a very romantic and a very uh, limited idea of what artists are actually imposing um some kind of a work ethic on artists. Who cares? I mean, some some artists actually have other people in the studio work for them. Mm. Andy Warhol, for example, uh, produced um, almost mass-produced art. It's still art. Yeah. Even though some of them he never touched. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, what true. century are you living in? It's either a good picture or it's not a good picture. Yeah, but it's a, a thin line, you know? It's... <sighs> I can imagine for some creators uh, in the photography business that this, that this is mm, difficult to wrap your head around, you know? Well, when photography was invented, um, let's just say 100 years ago, I don't know exactly, um, uh, painters were panicking uh, and they would say, this is cheating. Taking a picture is cheating. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Because you're taking a portrait <laughs> of someone and we were, that was our job, you know, getting painted to make Portraits. a portrait of someone. Yeah. And then after that, uh, of course, uh, when you had cinema coming up, uh, people would say, no, 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 this, this is wrong. I mean, this is, uh, this is artificial. It has no soul. <laughs> this is not <laughs> real life. So actually what you're doing is, is repeating a cycle of people thinking that an artist should suffer for his art, and I don't think an artist should suffer. The suffering is no part of it. It's just a little history, the backstory, la petite histoire, and and this can help to sell more art. Yeah. If you suffered as an artist, like with Van Gogh, right? Um, uh, but basically, art is art, and either it's good art or it's bad art. Who gets to decide whether it's good art or bad art? Well, first of all, experts, mm -hmm. like in this award organization, yeah. and the public. And they stand in front of it when they see it, when they experience it. Does this change them somehow? Good art changes you. 
you're different after you have experienced the art and that's when you know it's good art. Yeah, okay, yeah. There are people who are in the Louvre in France and they look at the Mona Lisa, which is this very small. Have you ever seen yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's tiny, it's right? It's no. dark, it's tiny. And uh, and uh, it's very crowded, so there's always like a lot of people. Uh, a big wall with a with glass, glass panel. Glass yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, and Yeah. And when you stand there, you just... You have to see it once in mm. your life. It's one of those things that you have to do, like should be on the universal bucket list. Go to the Louvre, which is amazing. I like the building. The <laughs> building is amazing. <laughs> and uh, and then you have this glass pyramid. Yeah, so it's it's that's an amazing that's... building. You have to go there. And then just, you know, and just stand there in this crowd for like 10 minutes and listen to what people are saying about this piece of art. And this is one of the artworks that, let's say, 99% of the Experts agree on that it is one of the most famous pieces of art, right? So it is art. Famous, but not Fam the best one. And yet there are people who are uh, seeing it for the first time and say, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't yeah. get it. True. This is called art. This is, they call this art. It's like dark. She's not even attractive. What is this thing? It's just a portrait. I can do this. So it's it's subjective. Yeah. There's a technical part of art when you know this is this is really well made. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can see in photography, for example, that it tells a story, um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, there's a number of things. It's well well made, and it touches people. It changes them, and then I think it's art. And this picture uh, by what's his name again, Boris Aldarsson, is a good picture. It uh, it touched my heart. There's uh, an interesting story behind it, and and I, you could write. A whole book about the the imaginary backstory of this picture. So this is art. This is a great winner, and I salute you, Boris Alexson, um, to pointing out to everyone that we're having the wrong discussion about generative AI. Now, of course, I know what you're all thinking. Um, I'm not sure if there are any comments. No. What is the right discussion when we talk about creative AI? And there's a new one uh, that I didn't see coming. Um, the new discussion about generative AI is um, you have trained this AI mm -hmm. with billions of data points, yeah. images, text, videos, and that's what the AI has been trained on. So it has been fed uh, a content that was made by humans. And I, th I used to think it was very... You know, it wasn't very clear what exactly this content was. And I thought, you know what, they probably started with Wikipedia <laughs> and then followed all the links yeah. from Wikipedia. Yeah, and yeah. and, and that, that's how I would do it. Um, but it, it now appears that it's also been trained on a number of other things, like, for example, on Twitter. I could, of course, Twitter, because... Yeah. Elon was... Investor. Unhappy about that. But yeah. Twitter is the only social media network for now um, that is still, you don't have to log in yeah. to see what the content is. So this made it a very good candidate to scrape the content and feed the AI with it. Mm. Uh, I don't think, uh, you know, the current CEO, and I don't even want to spend money on this anymore, um, um, has, he says, I'm going to sue OpenAI because they trained uh, the chatbot on, on Twitter data, first of all, this data is user generated, so not even mm -hmm. his, uh, legally speaking, not even his. I think if you're like a lawyer or something, it's very murky waters, very unclear. And if it has been published, put publicly open for everyone to see, can it be scraped uh, by a company like OpenAI to train uh, their AI on? That's that's the new question. It's a very interesting question. Um, it, it does explain because, for example, it was also trained on Reddit. Okay. And that explains why there is a grandma in there that <laughs> knows how to make napalm bombs. <laughs> because that would yeah. never, never happen on Wikipedia. It does, however, happen on Reddit. Yeah. There's always someone. Yeah. At Reddit, it's it's amazing. I, I I love the way it evolves as a platform, but it is still a little bit the dark underbelly, the underbelly of the internet, right? There's always a subreddit. There's brilliant subreddits like "Am I the asshole?" Do you know that one? Yeah. A yeah I yeah, yeah yeah because yeah. Wasn't my for anything. you as well. Ask yeah. me anything. A great concept also uh, at Reddit. Ask me anything with Keanu Reeves was brilliant. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was the closest people ever got to talking to an actual godlike person. Um, uh, that that's oh. uh, yeah. So Reddit is great, but it also has subreddits that yeah. are wow. Uh, the worst one uh, from the past years, except for the ones who are actually not just the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but actually discuss this type of you know really nasty content. Like, but one of the bad ones uh, was the Donald, uh, which was full of you know uh, Donald Trump uh, fans. Anyway, so. AIs are being trained on uh, content that was published, put publicly online, yeah. uh, on the internet. By people. Including, by people, uh, by humans, right? Uh, yeah. Including Twitter and, and Reddit. So um, this uh, uh, opens up a number of doors uh, that um, that were closed before. So let's, let's start with uh, the EU. Do you remember when we talked about Italy wanting to ban ChatGPT, because people who were having conversations with ChatGPT would probably share private information that, and they wanted to make sure that it was, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, um, but now, of course, uh, on a European level, um, OpenAI is being challenged uh, differently, not about private personal information, uh, but about the fact that it has been trained on content that was made and published by humans. Yeah. Uh, that's a can of worms. Uh, who, how are you going to, do you remember that, was it Mid Journey where you could actually still see that it was trained on Getty images because yeah, you could yeah, still- yeah. the watermark. Could, the watermark yeah. was also generated. Yeah. A bit, a bit, you know, it was a bit, changed but you could still see we had it uh, with uh, will smith eating spaghetti as well one of them yeah. uh, few clearly weeks ago. still yeah. had like something that looked a lot like uh, the watermark you don't have that for tweets or reddit posts no so getty images has a point um but how are you going to be able to prove that openai the company um has been using uh, this this yeah, it's not even private info. It's private content. It's human user-generated content. I mean, it's being linked to privacy regulations in Europe, but I don't think this is about privacy. This is about intellectual property and yeah. who has everything that I've been tweeting since 2007. I put this up publicly. I never had an expectation that, that I would be able to claim <laughs> copyright I, I don't know. I, if you put it up public, it's different when you're like an artist or a photographer and then you use something like a watermark yeah. uh, to make sure that it's easier to discover. Um, and, uh, but for a text, that's, that's yeah, that's kind of hard. I mean, there's so much of it. So Everybody that's, needs money. <laughs> sue, um, sue, sue, sue. And then the same discussion. So it's not about your content being copied by an AI, because an AI doesn't copy content, it learns mm -hmm. from someone's style and then learns to create new stuff in the same style, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so what about music? I was going to show you, um, and we could be able to listen to, to the viral song of the past week, uh, which was, but I'm, I'm talking in the past tense, so you know it's no longer there. Um, it was a, a song um, that was, um, a collab between Drake and The Weeknd. And uh, someone uh, fed an AI with uh, Drake's uh, singing voice and The Weeknd's singing voice. There was also a female singer in there. Uh, and then uh, created a very convincing Drake song with it, uh, published it, and then also uploaded it to Spotify. And that's where <laughs> things went really yeah. wrong. Yeah. Um, Drake himself was rather unhappy about this, and I can understand that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that n not just, you can't stop someone from uploading your voice uh, to an AI and then um, have new content generated with it. We've had many examples of this, but I think Obama's voice is, uh, is was one of the first. Uh, Morgan Freeman is also a very popular voice. Um, but this guy made money with it. So it, it at a certain point in time, it had been streamed 70,000 times on Spotify. It still does make you a lot of money. I mean, you could have like to buy a coffee with that. 
but it's the principle. Yeah. And and I understood Drake. Yeah. Um, that he said, um, um, I'm not comfortable with this. Someone is actually copying my, not just my style of writing songs, but also using my voice. Legally speaking, it would be very hard for the individual Drake as an artist to sue this guy mm. because he didn't copy his music. Yeah. Ah. He didn't copy his music. Oh, that's uh, the thin line again. <laughs> yeah. He had an AI write a song in the style of Drake, and then he had a, a, a singing voice uh, sing these lyrics that was trained on Drake's voice. So you can feel that this this is the new discussion. Um, however, why am I still speaking in the past tense about this song? I didn't like it, by the way, but <laughs> it, a lot of people did. Um, but I'm I'm not a big fan of, of Drake's music. There's a lot of auto-tune in there. And mm. I, I just, whenever I hear auto-tune music, I think, okay, it was okay for Cher to yeah. do it like once. Uh, and then it should have stopped. Anyway, uh, Universal Music Group stepped in. And they, of course, have like a, an army of lawyers uh, and then uh, put a stop to it. And so the music, uh, the, the, it, it cannot be heard anywhere anymore, not even on Twitter. Okay. Um, maybe there are some dark corners on the Internet where you can still listen to the song, but it's, uh, uh, it's disappeared. It's been scraped. And, and you think, of course, Universal does this, but then you can see the point of view of the artist Drake, right? It's yeah, his yeah. voice. Of course. Universal probably has the right to Drake's music. Okay. Do they have the rights to Drake's voice? Mm. <laughs> oh my God. <sighs> because. Well, we need Wim. Uh, Wim wants to join the, the podcast. Who he's is my, Wim? He's my lawyer. And he's, he's a lawyer. What's yeah. his full name? Uh, Wim Weismans. Wim Weismans, yes. Well, forward this to Wim and uh, maybe we can, we can invite him next week yeah. to have it. Does Universal own the rights to Drake's voice? Because personally, I don't think they do. It's possible as an artist to sign away the rights mm. to your image. I know that, for example, uh, someone like Angelina Jolie, uh, many years ago, um, she probably signed off the rights to yeah. her image so that they could create a movie like Beowulf, uh, where there's this um, CGI generated version of her, which was great because then she doesn't have to be physically there. Uh, uh, to record a movie. I, I think legally speaking, as an artist, you can sign away the rights to your the way you look, yeah. uh, the way you dance, uh, the way your sound. There will be new articles in the contracts, I think, exactly. in Hollywood. <laughs> I think they're already there. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure there's no such contract between Drake and Universal. No. Maybe there is now. But I'm not sure. Would, would Drake even want universal to have the rights to his voice why would he sign that contract he has nothing to win yeah. with a, 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 a such a contract because then for example universal could use artificial intelligence to have someone a lot cheaper sing the lyrics yeah and then they would make money with it but drake wouldn't so uh, this is this is uh, uh, this is the new discussion about generative AI, and I I think it's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. It changes the way artists uh, need to think about monetizing their talent. Yeah, yeah. Not um, and it's not no longer about the artwork. Yeah. It's uh, it's about the assets, the personal assets of the artist, and uh, and that is legally speaking. New ground, I think. Yeah. So that's another door that AI opened. Now, there's Drake who was worried, and there, there, there's a completely different uh, artist, uh, Liam Gallagher of Oasis. So there's a UK band. I think they're called Breezer, and uh, uh, they had a point to make. So I'm not sure when the last Oasis. So they have split up. At least ten years ago, I think. If I remember well, I'm I'm not an Oasis fan, but I remember the Me whole either. the whole drama around the fact that they split up. Let's just say ten years ago. So there hasn't been an, an Oasis album mm. uh, since the split up. Uh, and uh, so what this uh, UK Breezer band uh, decided to do is to create have AI create a new <laughs> Oasis song. So they they train an AI on an Oasis song, and then they publish it. Now let's this one is still online. So. 
Um, um, it's called AISIS, which I also think is hilarious. Uh, AISIS. I, I mean, want to be. I, I want to be on. A, I, I almost felt like I could smell the the grass from uh, one of those famous Belgian summer festivals. You know, the typical smell of being there, yeah. and then hearing a band play. It's very, very convincing. Uh, so, someone on Twitter uh, asked Liam Gallagher. <laughs> Asked Liam Geller, hey, Liam, have you listened uh, to the AISIS album yet? And uh, he's responded a couple of times, but the first time he responded, not the album, heard the tune. It's better than all the other snizzle out there. So you actually oh, liked it. Nice. How oh, cool is wow. that? So uh, it's interesting to see how th this, uh, this, this discussion uh, the point of view of Drake and the point of view of Liam Gallagher. Um, um, it's so new that. Um, um, you know, the lawyers are getting all excited, but I think the artists, I think most of them are triggered yeah. uh, by this. It, yeah, 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 that's true. They're in, it, it, uh, yeah. Uh, if I were a musician, I would just uh, have sleepless nights about this and then think about, okay, but how can I turn this into an advantage? Because otherwise it's just the lawyers that will win. Yeah. I mean, they will get paid, they will make money with all these lawsuits. Uh, how, there, there should be a way for artists to get more out of this, yeah. and I, I like, I like the doors that it's opening. Yeah, royalties. What is the concept of royalties? Yes. Maybe we need to rethink royalties exactly. and all the exactly. law and stuff around it. Yeah, um, crazy. So it's wow. uh, um, if if I were like uh, an artist today, I would be very comfortable. But it's challenging, you know. What part of me can I monetize? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. You have uh, websites like Printify and stuff like that, so mm -hmm. you can upload designs to put on a T-shirt or uh, a mock or something like that, and they sell it for you. And you, yeah. It it, it just what what it what it teaches me this whole new discussion is that being an artist is all about your unique style. Mm. Yeah. And, and that's why people will subscribe to your channel or buy your music or go to a movie. That's what they bring to the table. Individual artists is their unique style. And uh, the, the, the challenge today now is that it's very hard to put what a style is in writing. Um, but now we will have to. Yeah. Yeah. We will have to uh, because the eye is able to learn from your style and then copy your style. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, oh. wow, time flies. Uh, any comments so far? It's been awfully quiet today. Yeah. It's, uh, the weather is good. The weather is good. And then people are thinking, you know what, you crazy people. <laughs> it's after five o'clock. You should be outside having a drink. Wine o'clock. Yeah, yeah, wine o'clock, right? Well, let's, let's, uh, let's just uh, finish with uh, a number of weird and wonderful things. Um, remember grandma that you used to jailbreak yeah. uh, the AI? Well, let's just hypothetically say that she's still alive and you want to gift her something, uh, a piece of design. I think it's Scandinavian design because it, the, the designer is called, is Icelandic. He's got a very cool Icelandic name, so I'm probably butchering it, but it's got a lot of umlauts and, and, and weird characters in it. Uh, but I think it's pronounced uh, Doug Gudmunds Dotir. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a mouthful. Probably a girl, which I love even more, a female artist. And she designed an object that uh, she calls uh, Lifetime. Can you, can you maybe show, show what it looks like? Um, so a bit, a bit of, uh, I, uh, yeah, um, underneath the girls, underneath the Japanese. Yeah, we're scrolling through dog. Oh, do okay. Yeah, there it is. 
Uh, you have to scroll down a little bit until you see the actual object. There it is. So it looks, uh, at first sight, it looks a little bit like a, like a couch. It has pillows on it. You can sit on it, uh, but it's multifunctional. So you can also turn it into a bed, um, much like you have this concept of day, day beds yeah. uh, when you're a student. Couch surfing. Uh, yeah. Yes, and then and then it, maybe if you scroll a little bit down, you can see what it looks like as a bed. Oh, no, okay, that escalated <laughs> quickly. So it's a couch, it's a bed, and it's also a coffin. <laughs> Uh, uh, so um, it's the perfect because of the material that it's been made with um, it's perfect for cremation oh my god yes because if you want to be cremated you don't want to be cremated in like a, a lead coffin or an, you know a gold coffin it has to be made of very you know the type of material that uh, you know burns nicely and then yeah. leaves away you know you have so when can I buy this in Ikea It looks as <laughs> if it could be, uh, could be, uh, yeah, Ikea could, could uh, I think I, I like, I like it. It's funny. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's, it's, it's actually, it's the only piece of furniture you will need in yeah. your life. Yeah. <laughs> And that's why it's called Lifetime. You can use it as a couch. Uh, in the evening, you just uh, uh, extend it a little bit so it becomes a bed. And then maybe if you're like uh, super lonely, I know I'm not supposed to laugh, but uh, super lonely, I know, but and, and just die. And then uh, it takes weeks before people find out that you're that you died. It's it's uh, it's very practical <laughs> you because you're already yourself. you died in your couch or in your bed. <laughs> and all they have to do is just change a few things and then they could just walk. You know, carry you out in a coffin straight to the crematorium, straight oh into the oven. Uh, so you, there's there's nothing. Nobody that's sustainable. Has to, that's sustainable. Very sustainable. Yeah. Very practical. Very optimized. <laughs> nobody has to touch your body ever again. That's great. <laughs> uh, oh. So the piece of work is uh, called Lifetime by uh, Icelandic industrial designer Doug Goodmunds uh, and the URL is. Um, Doug Design, so D-O-G-G, uh, D-O-G-G Design.com. Uh, and that's where you can uh, uh, have a look at this. Uh, yeah, maybe it's a gift for, to someone uh, mm. who is getting a little older in your life uh, or yeah. maybe for yourself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then um, the, the very last thing, um, the, the last but one, but the last thing I don't need you for. Um, mm. the, 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 remember we talked about Lo-Fi Girl? Mm -hmm. And then there is now also a lo-fi boy. Yeah. Synth, synth, synth wave, yeah, synth it was wave. called. Um, I have a variation on the same team. It's called lo-fi ATC. And ATC is uh, air traffic control. I'm not sure if you know that I used to work for an airline. Yeah, Virgin. Uh, yes. And uh, um, so the idea behind this is uh, I think you can pick like a random one. Uh, or just uh, the one we're going to listen to now is uh, from Pittsburgh Airport. And it's a combination of chill music uh. and messages from um, the air traffic control tower of the oh. Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah. Okay. We'll get there. Don't worry. Ooh, yeah. Vibing in the studio. Ooh. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the message, but it's awfully quiet in the. Oh, but it's night in Pittsburgh. Ah, they're not <laughs> flying. Oh, we're so stupid. Airport. We are so because it's a live, uh, it's a live feed from the airport, and, and what time is it now in Pittsburgh? It's like three in the morning or something. Uh, what time is it in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? Uh Yeah, it's it's Friday. It's like midnight over there. Random airport, Seattle. Yeah, it's Let's give it. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I know I'm weird. <laughs> um, how how can listening, you know, eavesdropping on uh, conversations between people in the air traffic control and pilots? Uh, I've Like I, I've been, I've watched way too many true crime videos, but I also watched quite a lot of videos about air traffic disasters. Mm. And uh, yeah, maybe yeah. Still traveling my plane? Uh, 
Yeah. No, ever since the pandemic, um, I'm no longer comfortable to sit in a closed environment with 150 strangers mm. breathing. <laughs> okay. Nah, uh, no, I just lost interest. And then the very, very, very last thing is uh, a poem. And uh, as you know, I, I, I was trained as a, a linguist and I, I love poetry and literature. So someone wrote a never ending poem. Um, on a website called aliciaguo.com, so probably the artist is Alicia Guo. Uh, the poem is called To Be. Uh, the title is uh, To Be a Poem. And, uh, and this is how we're going to end uh, today. It is an endless poem. And I actually, I, I scroll down for minutes, 10 minutes at least, and it never ends. Okay. The poem never ends. Which I think is, is very, very poetic. Um, is a poem that has no ending. So what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to keep reading this poem. Um, okay. Walking away from the microphone into a void, into a void. Uh, and then whenever you feel like it, you just uh, press stop recording and that will be the end uh, of the poem. Okay. So don't forget to subscribe before yes. close starts. <laughs> yeah. Ah, poetry time. To be endless. To be kindly redefining. To be a bravado. To be a poor favoritism for impugning. To be a scoundrel unto her. To be a contour beyond him. To be frantically vulgar and grubby. To be one last potable solo. To be loved for my electrifying rehash. To be depreciating. To be loved for my gross note holder. To be helpless and debatable. To be loved in a stray facilitating ways. To be that moral consistency for them. To be ordinarily noxious and predictive. To be a good jasmine. To be a wider silicone outside their passivity. To be kilowatts. To be a quiche against her. To be paradoxically hydroelectric and tight. To be traditionally numb and potent.